welcome to the 2019 MTA Security Fundamentals Certification Prep Course. Let's take a look at this particular module. This module is titled Module Number 3. The topic will be Understanding Security Policies. Now, let's take a look at the objectives. And the objective of this particular presentation is as follows. In fact, we only have one objective, Understanding Password Policy. This brings us to a pre-assessment question. And the question is as follows. Which of the following is not a complex password? Is it A? Or is it B? C? Or D? The correct answer is B. Because you should never use the username as part of the password. So again, much of the world data protection is based, again, as we're well aware, based upon passwords. A password is nothing more than a string of characters used for authenticating a user and on a computer system. For example, you may have an account on your computer that requires you to log on. In order to successfully access, again, your account, you must provide a valid username and password. This combination is often referred to as a login. While usernames are generally public information, passwords are private to each user. And the key is we must always employ strong password policy. In fact, we must have written policies and directives specific outlining that your users must at all time use strong passwords. We also have to consider another area, the complexity of those passwords. Password strength is a measure of the effectiveness of a password against guessing or perhaps a brute force attack. The rate at which an attacker can submit guessed passwords to a system is a key to determine your system security. A strong password consists of six characters, and in other words, we're talking about more characters, the stronger the password, that are a combination of letters, it must be numbers, and also symbols. Passwords are typically case sensitive, so a strong password contains a letter in both uppercase as well as lowercase. Another item of importance is the length of that password. More, most of the passwords, in other words, a good figure, say around 60, 61%, are right at the password limit, either eight or nine character long. The average length was 9.6 characters, and the average password consisted of 1.1 uppercase letters. 6.1 lowercase letters, 2.2 numbers, and 0.2 special characters. Another area of concern is the minimum password age policy. You need to have a policy that addresses this issue because it determines the period of time in days that a password must be used before the user can change it. You can set a value between 1 and 998 days or you can allow password changes immediately by setting the number of days to zero. The maximum password age policy settings, what it does for you, in fact, it determines the period of time in days that the password can be used before the system requires the user again to change it. So that's something that we have to be aware of in regards to the time between the password changes. Password history, we want to make sure we enforce password history policy by determining the number of unique new passwords that must be associated with a user account before an old password can be used. Password reuse is an important concern in any organization as well as should be in your organization. Many users want to reuse the same password for their account over a long period of time. And as a result of that, what happens? That impacts you from a security perspective. The longer the same password you use for a particular account, the greater the chance that an attacker we'll be able to determine a password through a brute force or type of attack. If a user are required to change their password, but they, they, can't, they can reuse an old password, the effectiveness of a good password policy is greatly reduced. Here's a screenshot taking a look at, again, at a password policy. But remember, a password policy is nothing more than a set of rules designed to enhance the computer security by encouraging users to employ strong passwords and, and then use them obviously properly. Account lockout is a feature of password security in Windows 2000 and beyond. 
and later that disable user accounts when a certain number of failed attempt logins occur. Again, because a person entered their own password either, either by mistake or perhaps it may be someone trying to engage in some hacking activity to probably infiltrate your particular network or compromise your systems. Your account lock, this again is a screenshot of your account lockout policy. Again, it determines a threshold, determines a number of failed login attempts that will cause that user account, obviously, to be locked out. Understanding fine-grained password policy is also very important. They can be assigned to users or groups. Users you belong to more than one group that has a fine-grained type, what we call password policies, to it. The, the preceding value of each policy you use determine when, which policy applies to that member of that group. We also have a password setting objects, which again, this is an active directory object. Uh, this object contains all the password settings that can find the default domain policy. In other words, we're talking about the GPO policy history. A PSO can be applied to users. It can be applied to groups because what happened is the, P the password, again, what we call the password setting object, can be applied to a group, a user, and can also be linked to two what we call password setting objects. Security policy, again, when you think about security policy, it's a definition of what it means to secure your system, organization or any. For an organization, it addresses the constraints on behavior of its members as well as constraints imposed by adversaries by mechanisms such as doors, locks, keys, as well as walls. And except, you want to also have what we call an acceptable use policy that outlines a set of rules that must be followed by users or groups. And one of the reasons we have policies in place and we must make sure that we enforce these policies across the board, regardless of whether that's a good employee or not so good employee, we must have consistency in terms of the policy and terms as well as consistency in regards to enforcement of those policies. And accept the use policy is very similar to, again, a basic uh, end user type agreement. Uh, and basically, you want to have that, again, like, almost like when you have a software application, it's considered a software app. When you go to install the application, you have what they call an end user license agreement. Same thing happens when you install a Windows 10 operation. There's an end user. And basically, it outlines specific requirements and things that you as a user must adhere to. Likewise, the same thing stands for if you have a, a separate use policy within your particular organization. A password policy is a set of rules designed to enhance the computer security. Again, by encouraging, again, the goal, we want to encourage the user to use Scrum password. It also specifies whether multi-factor authentication should be used and whether you have a, lock, a lockout policy is used as well. Here again are some of the common attack methods. Now, obviously, passwords have long been recognized as a very weak link in most systems. First, you must be complete, first you are completely reliant on users and selecting the passwords. Second, even though you may employ or require strong passwords, they are vulnerable to attacks through a variety of different what we call mechanisms, like for example, brute force attack, dictionary type attack as well. That brings us to exactly what is a dictionary attack, you may ask. Basically, again, a dictionary attack, basically in computer, uh, what we we'll call cryptanalysis, basically a dictionary attack is a form of brute force attack for defeating a cipher or authentication mechanism by, by determining, the again, its decryption key or prayer, uh, uh, pass phase by trying hundreds or sometimes millions of likely possibilities, such as a dictionary. Your dictionary attack, again, that, that's why they hence the term called a dictionary type attack. That's why it's so important that it cannot be overstated that you have to make sure that your passwords are very complex. You don't want to use usernames in the passwords as well. A brute force attack, on the other hand, is a trial and error type method to obtain information such as your user password, your personal identification number, or PIN. In a brute force attack, automated software is used in this case to generate a large number of consecutive guesses as to the value of the desired data. Another example, if you think about with our accounts, many of us log on to our bank accounts. They give literally give you three attempts. You get it wrong, guess what happened? It locks you out. And oftentimes, they may require you to contact that bank in order to be able to facilitate the process whereby that account is unlocked. It don't automatically unlock itself. However, Within the Windows operating system, you actually set it up where it locks the account out for about an hour. 
Or perhaps you may have it set up where when that account gets locked out, they need to contact your, the IT department or information technology department to have someone actually be able to unlock that lock, uh, unlock that particular account or on your account, basically manually speaking. Did you know, again, there's a difference between a dictionary as well as a brute force attack? Let's begin by first of all defining what is, in fact, a dictionary attack. If you look at it from a perspective from, again, cryptanalysis and computer security, a dictionary attack is a form of brute force attack or technique for defeating a cipher or authentication mechanism by trying to determine its decryption key or passphrase by typing hundreds or sometimes millions of likely possibilities, such as in a dictionary. Then you look at a brute force attack, it's a trial and error type situation or method used to obtain information such as your user's passwords or personal identification number or PIN. In a brute force attack, automated software is used to, again to generate a large number of consecutive guesses as to the value of the desired data. Physical attacks, again, this anytime your computer can be, again, physically accessed by attacker, that computer's at risk. And as we mentioned before, security is a moving target. You're going to, given the fact of the nature of our society today and the number of cyber attacks, we're seeing a, it's definitely a significant rise in cyber crimes. When you look at physical attacks on your computer, it can be completely bypassed almost all of the security mechanism, such as capturing your passwords, again, through the use of a key logger. In fact, if your encryption key passes through a key logger, you might find that even your encrypted data is perhaps also in jeopardy as well. We have snippers. Now, a sniffer or a packet sniffer is a tool, and what that tool does, essentially what it does is intercept the data flowing in a network. If a computer is connected to a local area network that's not filtered or switched, the traffic can be broadcast to all computers contained in that same segment. This doesn't generally occur since computers are generally told to ignore all incoming, all coming and goings of traffic from other computers. But again, sniffers are valid forms of test equipment used to identify network and application issues. It's also important, again, when we look at protecting our domain user account passwords as well. You have a term called device guard. Now, this is one of Windows security features that is a combination of an enterprise-related hardware, firmware, software, and it has security features. When it's configured together, it will lock down a device so that it can only run trusted applications. We also have credential guard. Basically, what it does, it uses a virtualization-based security to isolate secrets so that the only privileged system software can access them. Obviously, both of these technologies are available only through Windows 10 Enterprise. We reached a point for post-assessment question. Let's take a look at this question here. What do you, do you call a password that's at least seven characters long and uses three of the following categories, uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and special characters? If you selected D, you're absolutely correct. It's considered a complex password. Password complexity involves the characters used to make up a password. A complex password uses characters from at least three of the following categories. It uses uppercase, uh, lowercase, as well as numerical numbers. During this particular course or module, we discuss understanding password policy. In the upcoming video, which is titled Module Number 4, we'll move on in our discussion of understanding network security, and the subtopics to be discussed will be understanding dedicated firewalls as well as understanding network isolation.